if you have spontaneous decay in atomic samples, all every single atom decays at any given time. They know nothing of each other, these different atoms. So if you have, for example, a thousand atoms, their decay is just a thousand times as strong as the decay from a single atom. If you, however, have super radiance, that means that all of them basically line up and radiate together. How does this work? So usually um, there, there's a difference between adding up intensities and adding up amplitudes. So let's assume we have our light waves are just single sine waves. Um, if we look at the intensity of those sine waves and add up two, then we get double the sine waves. But however, if we add up the two sine waves and then take the intensity of this, it gets four times as much or two squared times as much. And this is exactly which happens with light waves. If these light waves add up in phase, so that means the one oscillate like this, the second oscillate exactly the same in phase, then they add up and square. So you get four times the intensity. And exactly that's what happens in super radiance. So instead of every little atom doing their own little thing and sending out their, their, their photons every which way, these photons, they, they, they are sent off in a coherent or, or cooperative manner, all in phase. And so in the, in the extreme case, instead of getting thousand times the decay intensity, you get actually thousand squared times the decay intensity, which is the more atoms you have, quite a dramatic effect. And in fact, what happens is if you, if you would do that experimentally, usually if you do it with, with, with these diverse atoms, you get an exponential fall off of your decay. Whereas if you have super radiance, you get the really sharp flash, which falls off much faster because of course the total energy that comes out is the same. It just comes much faster. This was actually discovered um, in, the, in the 60s by Dicke, which is why it's called Dicke super radiance in its ideal case. And here the idea is the following. What he was doing, he was doing some kind of really simple kind of textbook exercise in quantum mechanics and said, okay, what if our atoms are so close together that if, an, if a photon comes out, we don't know where it comes from. Does it come from this, this atom or this or this? We don't know. Quantum mechanically, that means this is not knowable, period. So if we have many, many atoms that close together, and what does mean close together? Close together means they are much closer together than the size of a wavelength. In this case, um, if, if you have a fully excited atomic sample and then go one step of excitation down, you have, you don't know which of the atoms is excited and de-excited. So there is exactly one so-called superposition, namely the one where everything is weighted exactly equal. And then the next step, again, there is exactly one state in which that can go, namely where, which is completely symmetric for all of these. And so it goes basically the whole level down. Now, quantum mechanics is, is, is pretty tough if you, for example, want to do it um, numerically, because um, even if you have only two states, the total number that you, that you have to treat is two to the n where n is the number of atoms. However, if you, if you look only at these symmetric, so-called Dicke states in super radiance, you have only n plus one state. The one where everything is excited as the first, um, so to say the zeros, <laughs> and the one where everything is in the ground state is the n's. So this is from zero to n is n plus one different states. So this is actually very easy to, first very easy to calculate, and second, because of all of this radiation that comes out now, basically goes exactly in one channel, it has a very easy time lining up in this way and therefore adding up to n squared. This should be pretty easy, right? You just, you experimentally, you just take a, an ensemble of atoms, you just put them somewhere really close together and let it decay and then you get this out. Why doesn't this work this way? Um, there is, of course, in reality, there's much more to that. Um, the strongest effect that keeps this super radium from happening is that um, there is the so-called dipole-dipole interaction. That means if you put these atoms so close while they decay, 
they have a, they interact with each other in a um, with a distance dependent of one over distance to the third order, and that means. Um, the ones which are very close, they interact very strongly, and that means the, the energy changes a little bit. The ones that are a little bit further apart interact not quite so strongly, so the energy changes a little bit less, and so you get a widespread of energies, and at the, en at the end, these energies, they don't fit together anymore, and so this kind of nice adding up of these waves just doesn't work anymore. And this is actually, for a long time, that has been the reality in all the experiments which have tried to see this. It was seen, but it was, I mean, this, this square dependence was barely discernible over the noise, so it all, was all not really quite conclusive. And one of the problems was also, at the same time, um, that to describe this, this system theoretically um, from, um, from a point of view that, that can be realistically compared with any set up in an experiment was very hard because if you take all this this dipole dipole interaction to ac into account you are back from your nice kind of n plus one states to the two to the n states and there is no computer yet where you can do that for for a reasonably big amount of atoms so um, people tried all kind of approximation um, and eventually they actually got good enough that that this can be compared and the first, at least to my knowledge, the first time that superradiance in, in its pure form was seen um, was actually an accident. Um, in fact, um, this were, um, was in, I think, 2005, roughly. By that time, people wanted to, to see a sample of ultra called Rydberg atoms. So Rydberg atoms are very, very highly excited atoms, which should be relatively stable. The problem was they were not stable. So the idea is you excite them up, they, they stay there for a couple of milliseconds before they decay again. Um, the problem is they didn't stay for a couple of milliseconds, they only stayed for a couple of microseconds. And people were really puzzled, they couldn't understand what the heck is happening in this case. And it turned out after, um, after trying a lot of things that what happened was actually super radiance. So what happened is that because um, um, in these, what, what they, these Rydberg atoms, they are very high excited, but up there, um, the, the energy levels are very, very close together. What does that mean? The transitions have very long wavelengths. So basically every sample that you can have is very small compared to these long wavelengths. And so super radiance is actually quite likely in these cases. And this is actually exactly what happened. As I said, it was an accident. I, I, I don't think you could have done such an ideal experiment by purpose <laughs> in this case. So um, let's go a couple of years further, um, to closer to, to the present. And um, in the meantime, the, the research on ultra-cold polar molecules, or ultra-cold molecules, in particular ultra-cold polar molecules, has become quite advanced and quite important. Polar molecules have, the, their specialty is that they have many different hierarchies of, of transitions energy-wise. So they have, they have transitions that are in the X-ray, they have transitions that, are the, that go into the visible lights, and they have the so-called vibrational transitions, which are mm, somewhere between um, microwaves and terahertz waves. These transitions give wavelengths that are just long enough that it becomes, so to say, interesting for super radiance again. And in particular, um, this is not just an upper level and a lower level, but there's a whole ladder of levels which, over a large region, all have exactly the same frequency. So there are basically a lot of decays or a lot of photons coming out that in principle could kind of nicely coherently add up to super radiance. And it turns out that is exactly what they do. And the one experiment I'm aware of so far, which has shown that was also an accident. <laughs> um, in fact, um, this was an experiment where they tried to cool ultra, uh, molecules to an, to an 
uh, to an ultra cold temperature, which means going all the way to the bottom of the states. Turns out that that traditionally this is very hard. They don't want to go there. This is a very slow process. If you just let them sit there and let them fall down, you are sitting for years. <laughs> in the best case, or for centuries in the worst, okay? So, so this is not going to happen. However, in this particular case, it did happen. Again, why? Because it was super radiance. So what do we learn from that? First of all, um, unfortunately, super radiance is still something which is very hard to control. It happens, but it's very hard to control. So research in the future would really go into how can one geometrically and system-wise set up the experiment to actually see it and potentially take advantage of it. And the second thing, the other side, is how can we make sure that super radiance um, doesn't always show up um, accidentally. And the, the guess is that in fact for, for nearly all of the, the polar molecules that people study experimentally right now, super radiance for these vibrational transitions are actually would play a major role and definitely would have to be taken into account.